welcome back. This is our social justice episode, and we've got Julian Burnside, QC, and also Brendan Riley, uh, a former barrister and a solicitor with us in our panel. Migrants to Australia, they are coming from different backgrounds, different cultural, religious attitudes, and their attitudes, for example, towards women and children may be different. Because of that, there is an argument now going on because of this, uh, our minister's comments and because of the debate that's going on that we should uh, get away from the multiculturalism aspect and maybe limit uh, immigration as well. Uh, what are your opinions? Can I ask Brendan first? Well, this is something that when you get to my age, you've heard repeatedly <laughs> about different groups of migrants. As I was preparing to talk about this issue, I was reminded of Geoffrey Blaney's 1984 book, All for Australia. There's um, a section in there where he recites, if I recall correctly, um, the content of a letter that he received from someone ostensibly complaining about some um, Vietnamese immigrants. And the phrase that stuck in my head was, greasy smoke fills the sky. There are always people who will view newcomers to our country um, as interlopers and who will see difference as um, a source of concern and fear. I don't think that what we see these days with Muslim immigration is any different from what we saw 30 years ago with Vietnamese immigration and before that when I was a small child with the comments that I used to hear in my local area, I grew up around Northcote, um, criticising Greek and Italian descended people. So I think it's just eternal. Right, right. It gives a good perspective. Um, mm. Julian, do you want to add anything? To no, that? I agree completely with that. I mean, I remember I grew up in Melbourne in the 1950s and I remember people of my parents' generation talking about wogs and muttering darkly about these people who dressed differently and the women didn't learn English properly and they were too religious and they had too many children. And you hear all the same stuff again, again. repeated again and right, again. Right. And, and, and by the way, the greasy smoke in the sky um, um, reminds me that those Vietnamese were escaping greasy smoke in their sky produced by bombs dropped by us and our allies. Right, that's a good <laughs> yes. uh, comparison. So we are moving on. We are talking about those green cards. And Julian will be interested uh, uh, on this topic. If topped up, we can move to places. We can use our public uh, transport system. Yes, I am talking about the Mikey card. And as you might know, passengers who are intercepted by authorised officers without a valid ticket may be given the option to pay an on-the-spot penalty fine of $75. Now, uh, Julian uh, took on a, a case on a pro bono basis. Uh, Julian, can you tell us a little bit about the background first, please? Yeah, look, the particular uh, matter that got me involved in the issue was a bloke who had touched on, as he thought, at his, I think, Glen Waverley or thereabouts, as he always does. Um, it's like 8.30 in the morning and there's a crowd of school children all trying to get on the same train. The sun is shining on the screen, so he can't see what the screen says. Right. And when he gets to um, Melbourne Central, I think, at the other end, the gates won't open. He goes and looks for help and a very helpful railway attendant. So he went to ask help. He, he went to ask for right. help and a helpful railway attendant took him out through the disabled exit and handed him over to some authorised officers who then booked him. Right. Um, and he was offered the opportunity of paying a $75 on-the-spot penalty fare, by the way. It's not a fine, it's a fare. And um, <clears throat> although everyone thinks it's a fine because it looks like one. And um, anyway, he... Just he a more just, expensive fare. It's a very expensive <laughs> fare, yes. <laughs> anyway, he, he thought that he would uh, make a fight of this and he got someone at the university to approach me to see if I'd just do it pro bono because for $223 maximum fine, it just doesn't seem like a worthwhile proposition to hire lawyers. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, anyway, so I... Um, I got him to write to the Department of Public Transport and ask for CCTV footage 
of the machine where he touched on. Right. So that he could say, uh, I did really with try. support, I really did touch on. I right. did what I could. And made an honest And, and they, yeah. they wouldn't provide it and couldn't provide it. Right. I got him to ask for um, uh, the service records of the machine right. where he had touched on. Right. They wouldn't provide that either. Because you know his theory was the machine just didn't work properly. What they did provide was a printout of the transactions on that machine where he t thought he'd touched on for the 20 minutes either side of when he thought he touched on. And I went through that. It's really fascinating reading. It's a, a list of 17-digit Mikey card numbers <laughs> right. and precise times down to the second. Right. And I noticed there were about half a dozen instances in the 40 minutes or so that it covered, about half a dozen instances of the same card touching on twice right. at the same time. Right. So I thought, oh, well, I suppose if a person's hand trembles, that might make sense. Yeah. Half a dozen times is a bit unlikely, but maybe. Mm -hmm. And then there was a stretch where card A touches on, card B touches on, card A touches on again, card B touches on again, all at precisely the same time, in the very same one second. Right. right. And I thought, no, there's no real world events that gives rise to that. Yeah. And so we contacted the department and said, we're going to make a fight of this. Will you withdraw? And they said, no, we won't withdraw. You want to fight and then, and then I think, I think, I think it was the bloke himself or maybe the person at the university who contacted a journalist at The Age who'd been interested in these issues. The journalist at The Age contacted the prosecution about this particular case and two hours later, they withdrew the case. Right, right. And there was another case, actually. This is also from our research on the papers. Uh, a, a particular case actually went to magistrate's court. And you, again, uh, uh, on a pro bono basis, uh, tried to help. Uh, the lady's name is Linda Muto case. Yeah. Uh, and what happened there at the magistrate's court? You actually had to, in that case, appear. Well, I, I have in many cases. And I put together, I mean, I put out a, a general sort of uh, all points broadcast email to the bar and I got lots of volunteers straight away. It was very impressive actually and um, put together a team and between us we divvied up all the things that needed to be dealt with. And in Lindy Muto's case, as with many others, like hundreds of others, you go there and you show them you're going to put up a fight and they withdraw. In many cases, and uh, again hundreds of cases, where there has not been any obvious defence, but it looks crazy to find the person. Um, the, uh, what we've done on the team is to ask the magistrate for a sentence indication. In other words, what will you do if I plead guilty? And in all those hundreds of cases, the magistrate has said, I'll find the charge proved and dismiss it. Right. And that has happened. No one has been fined $223. Right, right. And, uh, now, did, let me make it very clear. I've not been doing this for fair evaders. If, right. if anyone approaches us and it looks like they're just trying to evade a fair, you they can take a look after themselves. Yeah, yeah, right. This is about a system that is working unfairly or being run by bullies who behave unfairly. Right. We will be taking a short break now and we will be back soon.